Welcome to another episode of Varsity House Podcast with your host, Sean Crawford. This episode, we have co-host Carl Jones, and then we're bringing in the one and only Mike Golick Jr., uh, Notre Dame alum. Uh, we got we got two Notre Dame guys in here. Um, over Outnumbered the one Syracuse guy, but I'm sure it'll be a fun conversation. Again, thank you for coming on, Mike. Well, it was it was short notice, and um, you were you were traveling today. But you, you, we talked a little pre-show. You said you were traveling from Connecticut. Uh, talk about that a little bit, and like I guess why you're making that move, and why you decided to drive. Yeah, so uh, I've lived in Connecticut for more or less the last 24 years. So my family moved there in 1998 when my dad started working at ESPN, and I left for college. I tried to you know play ball after college, and I ended up back there for ESPN. So I was living back at a house out there for the last six years in the town I went to high school in. So I I joked, like, I couldn't go out to a bar in Connecticut without seeing a person I went to high school with or a person I worked with. Like, it was, Mm -hmm. you know, a bit of a small pond. And so once I left ESPN in February and now took the job I have with DraftKings, I thought, all right, this is a pretty unique opportunity because podcasting is more remote because I don't have to be in the building in Bristol every day now. Why not do something a little bit different? I've always enjoyed Southern California. I've gotten to work out there. I have a lot of good friends and former teammates who live out there that I really enjoy being around. So I decided to do that. The drive, I can't really tell you why I thought that was a good idea. What I will tell you is for someone who is moving for their first time in earnest as an adult, if you have the chance and you are going to do that and you've got the means to, just hire someone to do everything. I mm. bid off way more than I can chew, which includes this drive. So the lesson right. has been learned, and I hope that if I can reach one, teach one right now, if anyone listening gets this, just if you have the ability, pay someone to move things for you. <laughs> That's funny because, I mean, obviously, like we talk, like you talked about living in Connecticut, um, and you, you, you have that like ESPN family pretty much there. Um, what's that like? Because I like we, uh, I definitely want to get into because me and Carl were from Ohio, so I definitely want to talk about just that background and pretty much and uh, specifically Cleveland. But what's that like uh, being just in Connecticut and kind of like everyone's around like for the same reason or kind of has the same like occupation? Yeah, it, it is really strange because when you think about it relative to other media outlets, if you work at Fox, you know you're on the Fox lot in Southern California. There's plenty of other industry people around you and, you know, the rest of Hollywood around you, you know, NBC is closer to New York, all the outlets out there. You've got big city hubs that have other reasons to be there. You come to Bristol, you are pretty much here to work at ESPN or the elevator factory that's across the street. Anyone who's (laughs) been in Bristol will, will understand the reference, but it's interesting because it does bond you sort of in the way that we're all used to bonding with people as teammates You've got an opportunity where you're all there for the same goal. You've got very little else in the way of distractions. It's almost like training camp in that way. Mm. And it does foster, I think, you know, I said nothing after football was going to top that team environment. There's just no other place where you've got to have the same accountability because football's so physical. Because if I messed up as an offensive lineman, somebody got hurt behind me more than likely. That doesn't happen in radio or in television. No one gets hurt. There's not a physical penalty. But when you're all around each other that much and you're all out there and you spend as much time in that building, it does create a cool camaraderie. So I have great friends that I made out there, obviously, My dad worked at ESPN for 20 plus years before I got there. And so I got to really gain from a lot of his experience through that and see things through his eyes. But even in my time there, getting to know people and having that set group of people that are all going through the same thing you are, are all working the hectic schedule you are, it makes such a difference on off days to be able to kind of get with them and, you know, vent or or have a drink or do something that you need to kind of blow off steam with other people that understand what you're going through. So that kind of team environment is really important, I think, for the job. That's that's pretty cool because uh, I – I, I know a lot of people is like talk about how it's just like a, it's, ran, it's ran like a like a factory and like mm-hmm. every everyone there is just like you're just part of the line you're just part of the factory line uh, and, you, and, you, and that's not and that's not wrong like ESPN yeah. has the benefit of being 
you know, the biggest four letters in sports. Right. Even though I'm not there anymore, I could still appreciate when things happen more often than not, the average American sports watcher is turning to ESPN because mm-hmm. it is a place that has built up trust over time, that it's going to deliver you accurate news. It's got the rights to a lot of the sports that people watch, and they've got personalities and people that they trust on that. It's a brand people can trust. I always liken it to right now, like you have a world full of cryptocurrencies right now in finance and it's new and it's different for a lot of people. And for the average American, there's still a lot of trust with brick and mortar banks to know, hey, if I'm banking and putting my money in Wells Fargo, I know exactly where it is. If I'm back, you know, putting stock in gold or the stuff that Warren Buffett invests in, I know where that's going to be. And so I think it's still that way for a lot of people, but it does, you know, inside of that building the culture is like a lot of places, one where you feel like you've got to be constantly doing something, one where you feel like you've got to be constantly trying to prove your worth. And it's great to have the opportunities as a young broadcaster to have all the chances that I did to do different things, to try different things, invaluable. I would not mm. be anywhere near as close to where I am in my career right now were it not for those opportunities. But if you're not careful, that work-life balance can get out of whack because you see everyone else working that hard. We all want to be perceived as hard workers. We all care about our jobs. And so that's the part where as you go along, you got to start to be careful and understand, all right, if there are other areas of my life that I also want to feed, then I've got to make sure that I'm watering those seeds along the way as well. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that's a pretty cool uh, point that you mentioned because, I mean, Carl could probably talk about this because he's a sports, a sports anchor in uh, Rochester. Mm. Yeah. But I feel like from a viewer, all I see on TV is just like the perfect setup of the shows yeah. and, the, and everything just flows so smoothly. Like every like it, camera just goes back and then it goes out for commercials and things like that. But it's cool like seeing how like some, cause sometimes they'll show you just like someone at the monitor talking and then they'll scan over into like the, the, the table or, or the booth. And is it, so do they, do you have like multiple, uh, I guess like setups like that, or is it just kind of like that one area that everyone uses and they change like the background or. So there is a lot more studios now. And like you said, Carl can attest to this, the amount of hands it takes in the pile to make any one show go. At ESPN, when I got to when I got to Connecticut in 1998, my dad started working there. ESPN was three buildings. I think it's now somewhere near 20. It's a college mm. campus. It is oh, okay. a massive, bit massive campus with multiple buildings, huge studios. They've added on so much, and so they've got big areas where they shoot all of that. Some of them they repurpose, they use for multiple things. But to your point too, that's just a fraction of it. You know, you've got buildings full of people who are working on what goes you know into ESPN legal what's in all the back end productions you've got our whole st- you know, I say our like I'm still there old habits their mm-hmm. whole research department there that fuels and helps the network sound as prepared as it does so all of those people as you walk all across campus you get used to seeing a lot of hard drives for all the data and a lot of people working cutting highlights looking things up it is a really impressive operation that only works because you've got so many people behind the scenes who are busting their ass to try and make this thing go so that everyone else can. Because for the viewer, they shouldn't know how hard it is. We're supposed to, it's our job to get on air and make it look like it's all easy to be a duck where the feet below the water are all spinning, but above water, everything looks calm. And that only happens with the, the team behind everyone that just gets to be the voice of the face on air. Mm-hmm. It's funny that you said back to your playing days, you wanted that feeling of camaraderie and, and, and as offensive lineman, when you mess up, the person behind you get messed up. But it's kind of like the same thing with TV where if the top, if the teleprompter goes wonky, right? And like mm-hmm. you can't, it's not functioning right. Or the, or the person behind the debt, uh, handling the camera and the, or the lights isn't, isn't on their A game. You as the talent in front of the camera, you got to make up for that. And I guess that's kind of like a way of, I still get that adrenaline rush where I'm like, you know what? One of my toes right now, I got to be witty and make this happen because I remember my first couple of weeks on the job, we had some new guys that were running the teleprompter and it wasn't, you know, up to speed. And I'm fresh out of college. I'm I'm reading it like a book and I'm like, Josh Allen up. Uh, and I'm just like, I'm, I'm struggling. So, yeah, I really, really appreciate, you know, just being able to to give the, give the viewer an experience that, you know, it looks like it's all easy and fine and dandy, but 
sometimes you really got to get on your P's and Q's and <laughs> look out for your teammates. Yeah, well, and, and that's a big part of it. Like, I think especially, and it's not to say that, you know, producers aren't also in that role as well, but I always think as the person whose voice is going out over air, and listen, the way that we're compensated relative to the other people as a part of that process, I always think, it's all right, it's my responsibility in some respects to lead. And I think you've got to learn how to do that in an environment that's a lot different in football. Football, we can be brutally honest with each other. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that we get stuff done because it's a bottom line business. We have to communicate directly so that we can go out there and get things fixed in between series, in between halves, in between games. You can't deal with everybody that way. And so you've got to kind of learn how to lead the people that you're around, how to be a good teammate in a different environment so that when moments come up like that, you understand, all right, hey, I can go and I can I know how to talk to that person so it doesn't happen again because there can be a tendency to get mad. It's your reputation that's going out over the air. But, you know, when you work with people that you trust and just like football, you know, I always say trust is gained in drops and lost in buckets. When you put enough drops in the bucket over time with people, you understand, all right. Everyone here is trying to do their job. We're all going to mess up, myself included, over time. And so we've got to learn how to handle those misses as they come up so that those are reps that we can learn from and get better from as a unit. I like the topic that we're on, talking, just trying to uh, connect the two, football and or just sports in general, to media and TV. Um, I want to talk about, just because I'm fresh into it now, um, never thought I'd be doing this, but... <laughs> It's, it's interesting because I always like my whole like pre game or like my pre podcast is kind of set up the same way, like how I did a pre game to where it's like for me, sometimes some games I couldn't eat. Um, mm -hmm. And just because like it was like I wasn't necessarily nervous, but it's just like that was like the last thing on my mind. It's like I'm making sure like for football, I was like I'm making sure my cleats are in my bag. I'm making sure I got the right gloves. I got the right tape, all those little things to where it's like now I got I was like I got I got to make sure like. I, my mustache is, is trimmed up. I got I got to make sure I got a, a, a nice little hat on or, or the setting is good. Like, so all those little things, it's like, I'm worried about all those things. So it's like, sometimes I forget to eat, but I always, I always go back to like my same music, my same like pump up music. It's like, it's, it's kind of like my new game day. And, and so uh, is, is that similar for both of you? Yeah, I would say definitely. And it's interesting for, for different platforms, how that shows mm -hmm. up because for, for radio, for podcasting now, we're all learning a new routine. And so I'm learning what I need, kind of like a game. You know, we would, the night before for our offensive line, we would have a test that we would all take as a unit together. So we'd be sitting around, we'd be talking through things together. I would have my notes a certain way. I would have how I scouted the team a certain way. And now I just apply that to, all right, what's our rundown look like for today? What are the points mm -hmm. I know I want to make? What do I need to be prepared for? in case breaking news comes down the line. So it's learning all those things. But to your point about the pregame jitters, that's why I think calling games is one of the most bits of fun that I have. I've gotten mm -hmm. to do that for the last like five years now and really full time in the last two years. And that one to me is the most like preparing for a game start to finish because I get to watch tape all week. I get to talk to coaches and players about what's going on inside these teams. And I get to be on site for the games. And it's still every moment for me. And, and obviously, I know the conversation around the national anthem and sports has taken on a different tone since Colin Kaepernick, all the things there, the way that we view that. But for me, less as like a, you know, a, a show of patriotism or anything. It was that last moment of calm I had before we went out there and did the damn thing. Mm -hmm. And I always remember like that was when all of the emotion and all of the nerves would hit me. And even now in the booth, I do the same sort of like I'm, I used to always get nervous and start tapping my hip pad towards the end of the anthem. And every time I'm in the booth, when the national anthem hits, I'm up there tapping it. I usually always let out some sort of weird yell that I can't control right before the game starts. And that one, just because I'm around the game day atmosphere, gets me back to that same place I was as a player. And it's so much fun to get to tap into a little bit of that and then not actually have to get hit or hit anybody at this point. Right, right, right. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry, so you hit somebody now, you're going to jail for it. So a uh, different dynamic. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> but, yeah. But uh, it's funny that you talked about preparing for uh, – calling a game because I talked to Sean about this last year. My my Getting my master's at uh, Newhouse last year at Syracuse, I thought calling a game was easy. You know, look at this roster, a couple stats, and, you know, <laughs> an hour or two hours before, I'd be, I'd, I'm good. I didn't watch football. I didn't play it my whole life. What's so hard about talking football? And then 
I had to do it. We did a couple mock games, and I'm sitting here. I'm like, holy crap. I've been in the <laughs> locker room with these same guys the, these past four years, and it is impossible to sit up here and not be totally prepared. I need to know what the third string wide receiver is like. The backup quarterback is so important because, as you know, the starter goes down. I need to know what the backup court. I need to know his hometown. I need to know, you know all yep. this type of stuff. So can you just talk about, like, for the viewers at home, it, they think it's easy, so to speak, to, you know, just on the cuff uh, to talk about those games like that. But it's really a process, and it's difficult to do so. <laughs> It is, and again, that's our job to make it look very easy, but it is the most fun I have of every game outside of the game itself. Like, that's a blast. The best part is when you get to throw away all your notes after because you use maybe, if you're lucky, 25% of what you've studied going into that game, but you've got to be ready for every situation. And, it, you know, the base level stuff, like, I want to pronounce everybody's name, right, because families are usually watching because I owe that to the guys that are doing a thing that I once did to have the respect to make sure that they get their due out there on the games. But then it's not only, all right, and this is where, you know, your teammate in the booth comes into play of how you guys kind of divvy up responsibility, but I got to know a little bit about this guy's background and what makes him tick. If there's any special interest stories that might help the fans understand their team better. And then... To your point, we're the ones that have played football. It's our job to show people watching the game through our eyes. How do I see this? What can I teach people when it comes up that might be helpful to them? I always want someone, whatever platform I'm on, to be able to walk away with like one thing they can steal and pawn off to their friends so they sound like they know what they're talking about a little bit more. We're here to give them social currency in the form of a football game. And so that preparation that goes into that, yeah, it, it's got to be very detailed because you're also, you know, especially if you're doing a national game every week, you're going in and meeting new teams each and every week. And you're talking to fan bases that see these teams each and every week. So they know them really well, and they're going to be able to smell it on you if you don't actually know what you're talking about and you haven't done your homework on these teams. And so it, it really comes from a place of we all played this, so we know what these players are going through. And I always want to do right by them, first and foremost. Like, I was a player. I always want to look out for players first and foremost. And so I want to make sure that we do them justice over the course of this game. And I can only do that if I feel like I know these teams as well as I know Notre Dame football that I watch and I live much more intimately every week. Mm -hmm. You talk about uh, just, like, how much you love uh, just doing the games and being, the bo and being in a booth. So – um, how how do you think the transition is going to be from doing that to now your your full time podcast uh, uh, now brought on by DraftKings? So how, talk about that transition a little bit and like maybe just one like some things could be, uh, that led you to make that dis that transition. Yeah, so I, I think part of it we already talked about. You know, the opportunity mm -hmm. for DraftKings it, it's a growing space. Like we're at a really fun time in sports media where there are a lot of different opportunities, you know, for guys just getting started who are just fresh out of school the way you guys are. There are so many avenues now to get the reps that you need to feel like you can do this job well and to enjoy doing it. So to see an industry like sports betting that's starting to get into content that wants to do that in DraftKings has a very sincere desire to put out good content, to bring on people and give them the freedom to do so. So that was exciting. But I think as much as anything, too, it was, all right, I'm 32 year old single. I'd like to have a family at some point. And the pace that I was going at ESPN, while it helped me a lot and I was appreciative of, I said, all right, if I have an opportunity to maybe get myself a little bit more work like balance, maybe get to explore some more of those things in my personal life and get a little bit more of that balance while still getting to talk about sports every day in a way that I love while still having the opportunity this fall to get to call games in one way, shape or form. If all that can line up and I can create a little more time for myself away from work, that was a real, you know, an opportunity I was really interested in exploring. And so the change has been just like anything else. You know, I always said the most difficult part of going from football to broadcasting is the feedback that you don't get because in football, we get it every day. We watch film. <laughs> Coach tells you the right and wrong way to do things, usually right. with a lot of four-letter words involved. In this line of work, you got to hunt feedback pretty relentlessly, and mm -hmm. you got to hope that someone is willing to invest that time in you, willing to be honest with you, and actually has an ear that you can trust that will help you get better. And so all of those things make it a lot more difficult. You really have to trial and error so much of this. And so for me, as as you know, long as I feel like I've worked in audio all of you know almost seven years now, which makes me a baby in this industry, 
it's now just a different form. So I'm learning a lot every day getting to do this podcast. I'm fortunate to get to do it with a guy in Brandon Newman, who was one of my teammates at Notre Dame, was a D tackle mm-hmm. that I went up against in practice every day that I took all, every class in our major with together. So I get to walk in with someone who I've got a great relationship, kind of the way you guys have known each other for so long. I get to walk into this and, and have that opportunity to learn along the fly, but do it with a teammate that I can know and trust right away, which a- at the end of the day with all of this, that's – half the battle think about any show you enjoy watching any game you enjoy watching you enjoy the content a lot but you enjoy the chemistry even more that's why mike and mike in the morning work for so long that's why pti has been on the air for so long why people enjoy those shows you know uh, pft and big cat at pardon my take whoever it is people come for those relationships and having that at the center of this i think made the transition a lot easier than it could have been otherwise uh you, you, I, I saw, I saw you mention the uh, the Stephen A. Uh, podcast or the podcast that Stephen A. was on with J, with JJ Reddick. Yeah, and you talk about the camaraderie and just the chemistry that people have, and mentioning how him and just Skip or when they first when they first started uh, when they first when they started first take they had the connection and they were just rolling and like the first I think he said in the first month their numbers were at the top. Um, but just I just want to talk about just like ESPN I guess a little bit more, but. And you talked about just the whole structure of it and just like how busy it was um, growing up and your dad being Mike Golick senior and Mike and Mike. And you know, like my, I mean, my dad used to listen to it. He used to watch it in the morning. And it was like, I feel like that was just like my like morning. That was my morning news was just, was mm-hmm. Mike, and, was Mike and Mike. So um, just, but like see, seeing your dad and just, and um, just knowing just the, the, I guess the struggle that, that he might've went through just, maybe not being home and uh, just like always on the road and just grinding a lot. What kind of um, like seeing all that, what kind of made you want to get also get into this field? Yeah. I, I've said this always first and foremost, you know, my dad was my hero my whole life, him and my mom both, but you know, my dad was so much like me. So I wanted to do the things that made me the most like them. And that was, you know, football was a big part of our family's life. Right. Notre Dame was a huge part of my family's life. And I grew up watching my dad then be a broadcaster. I wasn't, you know, I was a little kid when he was still playing in the NFL. So I don't remember him as a football player. I remember him as a broadcaster. And so it was another thing I saw him do. And personality wise, we're really similar. I would never shut up as a kid. So I always thought, man, that'd be a really cool way to stay close to the game. And for me, I I think it was, you know, twofold one. and, And this is, as we talk about representation and why it matters so much across all of sports, I don't know what it's like, you know, to be, to be a woman, to be a minority in this field, but I know what it meant to me to see someone that looked exactly like me doing the things that I wanted to do. It made it all feel accessible. It made it feel like I could do whatever I want because I watched this genetic copy of me go and be able to do that same thing. And so that was really empowering. And then seeing, you know, I think as I got to be an adult, seeing and remembering like the sacrifices he made to be around for us. My dad called college football games my whole life when I was a kid from, you know, when I w- we got there until I was in high school, I used to go to games with him on the weekend sometimes during bowl season. Like I remember he loved doing that. And then yeah. I got to high school. I was the oldest of the three kids in my family and my dad was fortunate. Mike and Mike was starting to take off and become a big deal. This was around like 2001 and he went in and told them, he's like, hey, I'm done calling games. I want to be around to watch my kids play high school football. I want to be around to watch my daughter and go to her swim meets. And he gave up a thing that mattered a lot to him because we mattered more. And now as I'm growing up, as my brother is married and expecting his first kid, as my sister is now married, I think the reason that they have a chance to be good spouses and good parents is because we saw the example set for us of even with how big Mike and Mike was and what that meant for my parents and and the attention that they got. It was still about our family first and they made that choice. And so as I sit here now and talk about work-life balance, it's because I saw that play out when I was a kid and I know the impact that it had on me. Talking about impact. I mean, like Sean alluded to earlier, Mike and Mike was also a big part of my life. You know, Sean, no, my mom used to always had a radio going any time of the day if she's not on the phone, right? And Mike and Mike was obviously a big part of that, but obviously it had like a a, a really big ending in 2017. Like a lot, the public got involved a little bit, and your, yeah. your dad talked about it a little bit. Just talk about your emotions and what you felt 
when the show ended and when it came to an abrupt end. Because I remember I was in my, I'll never forget, I was in my hot tub, the in, at, not my hot tub, at, at SU, <laughs> uh, getting some rehab treatment or whatever. No, I ain't like that. And getting some treatment. And I remember looking up at the, at the television and reading the bottom of the ticker. I'm like, no, nah, no way. So, like, just talk about what it was like from your perspective to see a show that you grew up on come to an end like that. Yeah, that's what I always tell people, too, is just like you guys mentioned, that was my whole life growing up. I, I I watched that growing up. When I was a kid, that was what we watched before we were going to school, listened to on the drive to school. Hell, when I was in the training room at Notre Dame, you know how awkward it is to have your dad telling sexy jokes about your mom and then playing the porn bed music underneath when yeah. you're getting your ankles taped and all of your teammates are in there and everyone wants to bust your ass for that? Like, right. That was... I'm sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry Bean says some things. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Bean was absolutely the first one to let me have it, especially because I was always getting in there early to make sure I got the ankle ankles taped up Mike being ankle Jesus, but, um, (laughs) I I, I digress, but no, it was, it it was tough. I mean, it was something that had been such a force for so long. And honestly, something I took for granted for a long time. Like for me, when I was away at college, I could turn on the TV and I could see my dad every morning. And that was just normal. I, I didn't know a world where he wasn't on TV in that way. And I think seeing the end of that and seeing, you know, between that and, and, you know, I got to work with my dad on Golik and Wingo after that. I got to be there for his last, you know, show on ESPN radio. But for me, I guess as a son and someone who had watched from, you know, up close for a long time to see the way that it had impacted other people. You know, I always saw when we were out in public, people who would come up to my dad and talk about how that show and his commentary got them through a tough time where they lost a loved one was on in the waiting room or the delivery room when they were having their baby, like these big life moments that were marked by what had gone on with that show. And so to see a lot of that bubble up to the surface, to see the respect that he had earned from so many of his peers and people that that show had helped grow in their careers along the way. It was also like a good reminder of, all right, that's, that's the goal. Like, man, if, you, if you're if you lucky enough and able to get a platform, and, and dad, I say lucky, that's not the right word. That was hard work. He was you know really one of the first at what he did. And that was another thing I didn't realize until the end. And I saw so many ex-athletes, and especially guys that weren't Hall of Fame players. My dad was a 10th round draft pick. My dad played nine years mostly as a backup in the NFL, but was able to go and work his way to that point. And it opened the door for so many other players who maybe didn't have Hall of Fame credentials to do that. And so seeing the way that he was received by his peers was awesome just as a son who's proud of his dad, but was also just like another reminder of, all right, that's the goal. Like, you you don't want fame. You don't want accolades. You want to go and just like in ball, you want to earn the respect of the people that you're in the locker room with. And you want to make sure you're the best teammate to as many people as you can possibly be. Mm-hmm. You, you talk about just like how, how important your dad was and you wanted to be like him. Um, we're three undrafted guys here. Um, uh, you, I, I was fortunate enough to be signed by the Raiders this past season. Uh, you, you signed to, uh, I forget the team, but I know you signed to a team. Yep. Um, Carl, unfortunately didn't have the opportunity to sign to a team cause it was, he went, he came out during like the whole, like the, the middle of the COVID stuff. Yeah. So it was, it was tough with like being, like being able to be, get in front of teams and all that other stuff. But, um, I, but I, you you kept you kept at it for uh, you you were on two two uh, two teams in NFL and then uh, had a stint with the the it was the, the FXFL is that what it was called Yeah man I made the rounds in 2014 is what it was called yeah. I had a I had a nice sip of coffee like you said I went to training camp with the Steelers and the Saints a couple of times mm-hmm. for the Saints played in the FXFL, went to training camp with the Montreal Alouettes, you know, never made a team, never made an active roster or a practice squad, but gave it that good, honest try for three years. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, so what, what was that? Cause I mean, I'm sure it's a, it's a struggle probably for all athletes, honestly, mm-hmm. um, whether any sport, I mean, basketball, football, or I feel like especially football, just because we kind of have the NFL or nothing to where mm-hmm. other sports can kind of go overseas. They can play in other leagues, um, things like that. But for football, it's like, some kids like grow up that's like all we know and it's like for me personally it was like dang like when when i was cut and then it was like dang like that was the first time i don't think people you don't realize it until it happened to you but it's like the first time that someone told you like no you can't play football um or like or just at least not for us you know so like um that's just like that was that was like a like a, a a rude awakening but 
um, you obviously like keep at it and keep at it, but, and you, and you, you did that for a number of years, but what was, what was that thing that, uh, that I guess that, 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 that finally made you hang it up? Yeah, I think it was a combination of things. I had always kind of told myself there'd be a three year window where I'd really just put all my eggs in that basket and try and make it work. And cause I understood after that, you know, if I hadn't made a team or at least been on a practice squad, it's going to be hard to really latch on because you're not playing football during all that time. Like I was right. a professional work worker, worker outer. I was professional <laughs> trainer. I can tell you all so these nice. different things I did yeah. to lift and gain weight and do all right by that. But I wasn't putting on pads and playing football. And so you really start to see diminished returns in what you can then offer as a player after that. So part of it was that. And, then, and part of it by the end, you know, you get cut so many times and you get bounced around to so many of these leagues that, you know, being honest, resource-wise, so far from what we experienced at Notre Dame, at Syracuse, mm -hmm. and big-time Division One football schools, and then getting to be around NFL organizations, all of it by the end, I, I just remember sitting around in 2015, and I was like, damn, I need a job that loves me back. Like, yes. I, I, And it was always one of those things where I knew this is what I wanted to do next. Quite honestly, I, I thought I had a lot more natural ability when it came to this than I did football. I was always a guy who – had to be a technician, had to work really hard to put weight on, had to be someone who was going to be, you know, a glue guy up on the O-line because I was never going to be Zach Martin, Quentin Nelson, Ronnie Stanley, these guys that we had there. And so I, I think after a while it was you get so many no's and your body starts to feel a little bit more beat up and you're not seeing yourself break through. I thought, all right, I'll go to this last camp with the New Orleans Saints. I got to go to training camp. I got to play in the preseason games. I said, let me try and put some good film out there. And if it doesn't work this time, then I've got to be at peace with this. I, I have kept at it long enough. I've kept at it. And I got to the end of that, and I got to play my fourth preseason game in Green Bay, which was awesome. They packed that thing out up there, even for preseason four, when me and the you know future Enterprise renter car workers are all out there slugging it out. And it, it was it was great, and it was really emotional. That's a place that feels you know spiritually a lot like Notre Dame and all the history around there. And went out, did it, and they cut me you know the next day. And I was like, all right, you know, I, I had started to do some media stuff while I was still trying to play, and I started to kind of lay that groundwork. And it, it just ended up being time. Then everyone's got that point where they find their limit, and everyone's got to chase that until they're good and comfortable with taking that next step. Because especially, you know, not everyone can do the Tom Brady where someone will happily have you back. Most of the rest of us, when we decide to be done, that's it. You don't get to play football anymore. You can mm -hmm. play flag football. But again, like you said, it's not like basketball where you can go run pickup at a, you know, at a local yeah. gym. You can go and play these games elsewhere. You don't do that with football. I have helmets that are decorative in my house now. I don't <laughs> put them on and get to legally assault anyone anymore. <laughs> so it, it, it had to be something that every individual is comfortable with. And that was just when I hit that point for me. Mm. Is there, um, I, I think, I think this will be helpful for a lot of kids or uh, just a lot of, a lot of people going through that, that similar situation. Um, just what, what were some things, I guess, uh, that you maybe at that point you, you maybe struggle with, um, or like mentally. And then also just like that kind of just like got you over the hump to where it's like, yeah, this is something I'm supposed to do. So the toughest part for me was getting over the insecurity of not having accomplished what I wanted to as a player. I was getting ready to get up there and talk on a microphone about guys that were doing the job that I wanted to do, doing it better than I had done and accomplishing the things that I never did. And I was supposed to sit there and not only offer analysis, but potentially be critical because at sometimes that's part of the job description. And Early on, I think for every athlete, and especially for the guys fresh out, I heard J.J. Redick talk about this on that podcast you mentioned, it's hard when you still know guys that are playing. It's hard when you're talking about people that you've seen in person, that you've lived the experience with, that you have a lot of respect for, and you potentially have to criticize. And so it took a long time. It took, you know, I, I would talk to my dad about that all the time because he had obviously been through that. And you learn that, you know, you're analyzing decisions. You're analyzing the actions. You're not analyzing and critiquing the person, the human being, you can be critical of decisions, especially if you've done the work to know, hey, this is what I believe is right and wrong in those decisions. When it comes to football, this is what I know based on my personal experience as what I perceive is the right or wrong way to do this specific process of decision making. And so if you're willing to do the work and put the time in on that, then you can go forward and feel a lot better about that. But early on, I was 
26 years old trying to potentially talk about grown men who had been in that business for a decade in that way. And it is really uncomfortable at the beginning. And I was racked with a lot of insecurity at the beginning about that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's interesting you said that and you talk about the insecurities because I felt the same exact thing. I mean, I still feel it to this day. I mean, right. we're, we're talking about the guys who just got drafted this year for the Bills and I'm going over like draft analysis stuff. And I'm sitting here, I'm like, first of all, these kids are younger than me. That's the first, the weirdest thing, first off. And then secondly, like, I watch these kids in, in film. Like, we play, like, we watch Florida. We watch, like, LSU. We watch it. So I'm talking about them. I'm like, yo, this doesn't sound right. But like you said, it was a part of the job and it's a part of the analysis. And it just comes with the territory if you want to be in this business and be successful, at least. But you talk about the help that your dad gave you. Is there any type of pressure or, like, any anxiety of trying to, I don't want to say live up to live up to your dad. You want to be the best version of you. But does that ever cross your mind? Because I know that there's a lot of people prodigies, you know, with, with the son, father-son prodigy dynamic. Do you ever feel that pressure to want to be my goal like senior, or are you completely at peace with yourself? Uh, oh, no, there, that pressure was there for a long time. Like, especially early on, you know, I got to work next to my dad a lot. I got to do a show with him for three years. And so you can't help but feel some of those eyes on you that are wondering, all right, you know, are you only here because of what your last name is and who your dad is inside the building? And just for me, like I said, I, I was, you know, not a, as fully formed of a person yet. And so I was looking around new in this job and I was trying to be my dad too much. I was trying to be other people who I watched and respected in the industry. You know, Dan Orlovsky, Louis Riddick, these people that you watch and think, all right, they do a good job of this. I need to do it like them. Well, I don't have the same experience that they do. I didn't go through the same things they did and vice versa. And so, no, it took me a long time to, I think, be comfortable and figure out just through sheer volume of reps and getting to make mistakes and getting to, you know, try different platforms to do radio, to do digital, to do TV and figure out, all right, when I go through all those, what are the common denominators that are unique to me? Like that's figuring out how to be yourself on air. What do I offer through my experience and the work that I'm willing to do that no one else can offer in this setting? And that took a long time to kind of figure out, all right, how do I stand on my own two feet where I'm super proud of the last name that I have. I've gotten a ton of help from my dad in ways that most people who try and do this job will never be able to really have because you know, I, I would go home and, you know, I lived with him for a long time. I, I lived 20 minutes from him and my mom when I was at ESPN. And so, uh, no, it, it took a while to to kind of figure out who I was inside of that building other than just Mike Golick Sr.'s son, which, again, a thing I was super proud of, but doesn't really, you know, help me advance in my career until I figure out what was unique to me and what I could offer every show that I was on. And, that honestly, I mean, I didn't feel super comfortable in that until two, three years ago. Like, I was at ESPN for four years kind of figuring it out, figuring out what that looked like, and, and it is a process. There's no doubt. Yeah, I have no idea what it's like to live up to that standard, but I did have a professor tell me last year. She saw that I was trying to, like, be like bring a lot of hip-hop and stuff and, and, and into my, my broadcast, and she goes, well, who are you trying to be like? I'm like... Man, Stuart Scott was my dog as a kid. Like, I looked up yeah, to him, like, yeah. R.I.P. to the late great. And she goes, mm -hmm. look, I have no problem with that. I want you to be, you know, take parts of uh, different people's games just like you do in sports, right? But she says, be the best version of you because if you're trying to be like someone else, the viewer at home is just going to tune in and watch that person because they're the best version of that. Like, there's no getting better than what they are, right? So I, I guess that's something that I st I'm still working with, you know, like, oh, man, you, you see how the way Stephen A can command the room or how Stuart Scott was able to, to throw his – legendary punchlines in there and, and they're like yo the, the viewer at home is just going to just watch the person that's the best at it anyway so just try to like bring the best version of yourself yeah but i mean that takes time like you you know like you said we all it's just like football where you try and do the technique exactly the way it's taught and then after a while once you've done it enough and you know the basics well enough then you figure out what works for you and so yeah i mean we all try on like i the way I, I likened it to someone the other day, when I was at ESPN early on, it was like being in the changing room at the mall. I got to try on a lot of different outfits and try and figure out, all right, what fit me the best? A and you only get that through trial and error. And so if there are people that you admire, it's like you said, you try out those things and then you go through and go, 
all right, and this is where listening back to the stuff that you do, watching back on the stuff you do helps because you'll look and be able to know better than anyone what's authentic to you, and then you'll pick those things out over time. But, yeah, it's it's we're all going to sit around and make mistakes and, and try and, you know, put on the wrong hat for a while. But I think that's part of the process, and, and you know, I, it's my one experience. It's what I've watched from other people. But, um, you know, I, I think it's pretty rare to find someone who walks in to a setting where personality, like where you're not a reporter or anything like that, where personality is part of the job. If you walk in and are immediately comfortable, you're just gifted in a way that I was not. Like I, I'm in awe of anyone who could do that because I had to mess up a lot to figure out how to do it the right way. Mm. Do you, um is is do you have do you have a moment like just looking back to where because you know always like you um you see a, like a kid where it's like his his dad is your coach or something like that. Do you have a moment to where it's like maybe when you start, you first got into TV, or maybe even now, um, where you have you you've came home, or your your, your dad called you and it's like, what are you doing, or uh, trying to or trying to like coach you up and give you like some some pointers or something that you may have done? Uh, is it, is there a moment that you could look back at that that happened? Man, I had a lot. Of, first off, I had a lot of those in high school when I was playing football, and a lot of that <laughs> critique I did not want to hear at the time. Like right. I was, I was like every other teenage kid playing high school ball where. You're sitting there Sunday morning after games and you're watching that film and dad's got something to say. And I'm just like, all right, whatever, man. Like, I really don't want to do this right now. Like, you know, it, we, it, we all take time to mature at our own rate, but right. no, I, I think, you know, for me, I was fortunate, especially with dad, like we got to grow through some of that together. And we've talked about it since, but like, I remember being on air and, you know, an argument he and I always go back to, and I say argument in the on air sense, like we didn't walk off mm -hmm. set and mad at each other. That's not, you know, right. You guys know that's not how this works. But um, I remember we were talking on air one time about, you know, guys, you know, tweeting about what was going on in the locker room. It was some NFL players who were tweeting about some sort of disagreement that was going on in the locker room. And my dad comes from a generation where that didn't happen, where what happened inside the locker room got handled in there. And in an ideal world, usually it would still happen like that. But I was basically trying to make the case of, Hey man, this is a whole generation of player that's grown up with the internet at all times. Like I got Twitter my junior year of college. I didn't grow up with that as a part of my life. We're getting to a generation of athletes that only knows life with that as a part of it. And that's just how people communicate to a certain point. Doesn't mm -hmm. make it right or wrong. It just makes it the way it is right now. And we both walked away from that kind of seeing a little bit more of what the other person was talking about. I was like, you know what? Like, in an ideal world, yeah, when you have disagreements like that, it probably is better to just handle them man-to-man -man behind the closed doors in the locker room if that's possible. And my dad walked away and went, you know what? It, it was something he had considered where, yeah, different generations going to communicate differently. We see it happening in real time now. And so I, I think moments like that when we were working together were pretty cool because they were conversations that were similar to what we used to have on the couch in our living room at home. And we got to have them in front of an audience and we got to have them in a way that allowed us to kind of flesh out and really, for me, find those areas where I disagreed with my dad and find those spots where all right, I, I was different. These are ways that I see the game and the world a little bit differently. And it was a fun as hell. Like, I'll never do anything as cool as getting to work with my dad five days a week again. But it was also really instructive for me as a broadcaster to figure out, all right, how do I have to, you know, come to this in order to be able to go toe to toe with somebody who's done this job for 20 years and can construct a lot of these arguments in his sleep, even though he was still in there every morning, highlighting, going over everything, getting together his notes the same way he had early on. So it was super helpful to do that. I saw he I saw he might make a uh, he might make the transition to DraftKings with you. Yeah, so that... he's over there right now. He does a one-day-a-week okay. podcast. Uh, go look and Smitty. Download it wherever you get your podcast. But uh, <laughs> it's him and Jessica Smetana, who was a Notre Dame graduate, uh, I believe, 2016. I saw her. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny now because it's like before I knew all the, the Notre Dame, like, football players or, the like, the NFL, like, alum and all that stuff. Now I'm, like, starting to, like – figure out who's like the Notre Dame and like the whole media out uh, industry. Yeah. We got to stay close together, man, because we are outnumbered by the new house crew and the Kellogg yes. crew from Northwestern. Like we are, we are still trying to make sure that we get enough blue and gold into the media space. Right.
But, but that's 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 always funny because it's like I, when I when I have him on, I was like, "Yo, start reaching out to the Q's, the uh, Syracuse network," because I know I mean I know it's huge, and so um, oh. definitely we're, we're definitely going to try to just like bounce the like Notre Dame and Syracuse um, like network off of each other for sure. That that Newhouse network is something different, man. So Anish Shroff was the play by play announcer in the college football booth that I was in, a proud Newhouse and proud Syracuse alum. And we got to go back last year and call the Syracuse-Clemson game on Friday night. And it was like being in town with the damn godfather. Everyone coming up to the booth, all these young guys at school there with their orange and blue ties walking in and asking Anish what's up and picking his brain. And he's going to talk to classes. Like, it, it really is, like, cool to see that, you know, uh, for us, you know, we always think about, like you said, that football brotherhood. And right. I was just back on campus for the spring game with, you know, everyone there and seeing that whole group around. But for Syracuse and that broadcasting school, it really is like that in the media. And you look around and see him and Tariko and the rest of these guys that kind of mm-hmm. like a football program come back to the university all the time and are present around there and are offering advice and help around there because this is an industry where who you know does matter a lot, making sure that you are, you know, keeping in touch with people and leaving a good impression on people when you get a chance around them. And Syracuse, you guys got the head start on that. We'll give you guys the early going on this, but we're coming. Rest assured. I hear you. I, hear. I was talking to Clough earlier about like our alum, and uh, Nick Wright came up, and I was like, and he kind of like in the middle, of the, the middle, middle of the pack, of, like with some of the guys that we got. We got some, <laughs> we got some real legends in, in the media space. But no, it's it's definitely cool to see. Uh, you guys, and also Northwestern. I mean, they're up there as well, and mm-hmm. there's a bunch of uh, teams in that in that space. But, but Paul, we got we got to touch on the Cleveland s- spot stuff at one at some point, man. Wait, hold on, hold on. I want you to. Uh, well, first, I want you to like also because I mean, I've, I've been from Notre Dame. I feel like we just take pride in just the the Irish and just everything that goes that goes into that whole university. But while we're talking about Newhouse, I do I do want you to talk about just like the relationships that you hope to. Uh, connect with and just also like what you like what you've seen from going through there just because I mean like he mentioned it's it's the top of the top and you're you're someone who's who's been through that 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 program to where it's like you know you got friends who are at different college or football programs and they don't see like a lot of programs aren't like Notre Dame aren't like Syracuse and so it's 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 different and so I definitely want to know like what was it like going through Newhouse and then also just like what do you like hope to gain from um, just that opportunity. So when I was on campus as a, I want to say as a, just a football player, I thought they were nerds. I thought they were geeks. I thought all that, <laughs> all that good stuff. Right. They, they walk around, you know, how the football team walk around with their chest out, you know, going to class whenever they feel like you're right. You know, you're going to know I'm a football player. Well, Newhouse carries their way, carry the students carry their way the exact same way. And I did <laughs> not like that as a student. And then I went back for my fifth year and I began to realize, oh, they got a reason to, to, to walk around like this. They work, those kids work extremely hard in that undergrad program. And I mean, the, the proof is in the pudding with all the, the guys who are in the media space. And when I went through the program, I was like, man, I, I'm going through, through these hallways and I'm seeing pictures of Sean McDonough and Mike Tirico and, and, you know, just a litany of guys. I, mean, I saw Nick Wright because, you know, you see him all the time on social media. I'm like, man, he got to be like top three. And I'm like, bro, not even top 20. And it was <laughs> like, <laughs> so yeah, seeing that type of stuff, and I just want to just you know connect with those guys because there, there's so many. There's a new crop that's coming in every single year that's gonna you know start the space up. I, I was working with Drew Carter, who was in Alabama oh, yeah. for a couple of years, and now he's. I mean, I think Gold. I don't know if you worked with him or not, but you probably know his talent level. Yeah. I mean, that's Boy Wonder right there. Everyone was talking about Drew Carter, even when I was just a football uh, kid, right? And then I and Eagle Son doing the same exact things. Clippers play by play right now. I mean, just being able to be the same age as these guys and. And I know I might not be able to know Tariko on the same level, but I know knowing Drew and knowing uh, Eagle Son um, on a personal level now, I know in 10, 15 years when they're replacing those guys, it'll be a really cool thing to see. So I'll hopefully being able to stay in contact with those guys. And like you said, it's a not a what you know business, but who you know. So it's definitely cool in that regard. Yeah, and getting to grow with those guys, like to get to kind of have the shared experience of all that because it is – it's super gratifying to see someone that – you were in class with or someone that you worked with. You know, I've gotten to watch a lot of my friends who have left ESPN to take other jobs before I did and to see them get there. And, you know, the way you go through Newhouse and you feel like you come out with a real leg up and knowing how to work in this industry, I was joked and my friend Trevor Scales said it like this. 
working at ESPN for an extended period of time is like getting a PhD in sports broadcasting because you do so much during that time that you walk out kind of understanding how to operate in every space that they can throw you in. And you're ready for all those situations like you described when things don't go super well. And so to watch guys like him go and succeed elsewhere, to see the people that you have either worked with or gone to school with accomplish all that stuff and to know what went into that, to see the work that they put in before they got to that spot. That's always cool to me because it's 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 like when we were on campus, I always said the coolest thing was we got to know the other athletes on campus. And when we would go and watch our women's basketball team in the Final Four, my roommate on the men's lacrosse team in a national championship, you know, people playing on the biggest stages or accomplishing on the biggest stage, I've seen them when things weren't going so well, when they were mm-hmm. struggling with things. And I, I know what went into that moment in a way that very few people are privy to. And I, I always consider you know, that's the best part of being a teammate is you get to see how the sausage gets made on a lot of this stuff, and this is no different. I, I, it's, it's funny because I never realized like how big Mike Tirico was, um, man, we, cause, cause he, he did Notre Dame, he does every Notre Dame game. So to me, when, you know, like on a Friday before the game, they all, the host, the whole uh, staff comes in, it was cool. Like Tony Dungy came in, um, and seeing these people like every week, they come in and talk to you, ask you questions. And like, you're sitting at the head of the table, like, like you're the man and like, and like, but really it's like, yo, this is like really Mike Tirico. And I didn't understand that until like I like talking to like my, and Carl and like some other friends are like, yo, like you like Mike Tirico is is a legend. And to me, he's just like, yo, he's he's a really cool guy. And it's like funny because like his voice never like that's his actual voice is. And that's 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 the funniest thing is because when I like I'm I'm imagining oh like that's his like t- that's like his TV voice or like Stephen H was like they got like this you the voice that you hear you just know it. And just just having a normal conversation, like same like posture, same smile, same everything. And it was just like it was it was he's, he's a pretty cool guy for sure. That happened with me with uh, Chris Collinsworth, because uh, oh, okay. so Austin. Uh, so obviously Jack Collinsworth, who is mm-hmm. now in this line of work as well. But his brother Austin was on the team when I was. And I remember seeing Jack after one of the games or uh, I remember seeing Chris after one of the games talking to Austin. And I remember literally walking back to the team bus and going, Man, he sounds just like he does on Sunday Night Football. Like, it's crazy. Like, I had no idea. It was just, it was wild to me. Like you said, that, oh man, that's just how he is all the time, which is hilarious coming from me, who I watched my dad do that all the time. But it's still like, especially when you know you see people in the booth like that, where you are kind of on. You don't expect that all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Carl, you wanted to you wanted to talk about the the Cleveland Ohio connection. Oh yeah, well you 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 already know. Like obviously you know that. <laughs> Any of you know Ohio is very prideful about their football. I'm sure that your dad and your uncle talked about it at at nauseum. Just talk about their stories of your uncle actually played for the Browns, but just talk about them growing up in Cleveland and just how that molded them into the players and into the men they are today. Yeah, it, it was interesting. You know, I, I got to to go back and see when my dad – so my dad was a St. Joe Viking, and uh, – I got to go back and see when he was inducted into their high school hall of fame and to get to walk around there and kind of see. And I mean, he was going in like Desmond Howard went to his high school. Like they had some heavy hitters mm-hmm. that were going in, in that class. And it gave me an appreciation. Cause I mean, I played high school football in central Connecticut. So we, you know, like the, the most prominent football player from central Connecticut, we can't talk about anymore because he committed murder and is no longer alive. Like, that's, you know, a different bag for us out there. But to see, you know, the tradition, because I played with a ton of guys who came from, you know, Cleveland and played football out there, guys that were from Cincinnati and played at all those schools and the GCL that are mm-hmm. super proud of all that. It is it, it is cool to see how much it matters to that area, whether it is there, whether it's Youngstown, like it is such a part of the fabric of life out there. And so when I would come back home and be talking about my teammates that were from those places. My dad would, you know, start talking about, you know, guys that he had played from those schools or, you know, what he knew about that whole area. But it really is just like a different pride that, you know, our high school football team in Connecticut was good for the area. It was something that we all took pride in, but it it wasn't celebrated in that same way. And so to hear how they talk about it was really interesting. And quite frankly, an experience I wish I had gotten to have. Mm -hmm. Um, I definitely want to touch on Notre Dame. Just, I mean, I feel like we have to. Uh, just 20, two, 2000, uh, 2012. 
Um, you were you were you were on the uh, national championship or the team that went to the national championship. Yeah. Um, talk about or were you, also I want to talk about um, just like the the where the program was mm -hmm. to to where to where it, uh, I guess to where it was when you finished it. So like where when you got there, and then also just the job that Coach Kelly's done um, to where your I think it was your senior year, right? That yep. you that you made it. Yeah. So. From the time that he got there to where he took the program, his um, your senior year, um, talk about that experience a little bit and just like playing in that national championship game. I know everyone talks about Notre Dame; they can't they can't win the big game, they can't do this all this other stuff. But a lot of people can't get to the big game, so it's like it's, 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 <laughs> it's, it's, it's very it's very hard to it's very hard. A lot of people can say that they can't do something, but a lot of people don't even get the opportunity to do something. So I just feel like I had to say that just you know, I didn't I didn't lost a couple of big games. So yeah, um, but yeah, honestly, I want to uh, I want to I want to hear about that experience because I feel like I've never heard it from like a player's voice, um, just like that whole 2012 season, which was, I mean, it was everything. Like you had Manti having the the greatest season ever for like a linebacker. You had Everett playing lights out. You had. Or it was Everett and Tommy spending yeah. time, and then you had Theo going crazy, and yeah. it was I just I, like as a as a like be, like I wasn't even actually a Notre Dame fan at that time, but I just I it was they were always on TV, and I just had to watch. So um, talk yeah. about that season a little bit. Yeah, man, you want to talk about being always on TV? We played I think seven night games that year. Mm. It was I mean, especially when you're playing them on the West Coast. We played Southern Cal that last one to, to go 12-0 and 0 and to go to the title. Right. I mean, we got back at 4 in the morning, and we're all gung-ho because we know we're going to the Natty now. And we're pumped, and we're like, yeah, we're going to you know, call the guys and get them to open up Finney's for us, and we're going to go party. <laughs> Man, we landed at 4 o'clock in the morning, went over there. I cracked one Bud Light tall boy, and I'm like, I'm exhausted, and everything yeah. hurts. What are we doing right now? So <laughs> it, it was – no, I, I think so – kind of encapsulating that whole thing. Like I came in, Charlie Weiss recruited me and gave me a scholarship. Right. I am forever indebted to Charlie. Obviously he had a lot of great moments at Notre Dame. He's a Notre Dame of love. That place matters a lot to Charlie Weiss. And so we had that, but we were, you know, a 500 football team the first couple of years there. And so unfortunately Charlie Weiss gets fired and Brian comes in. And, and I would say the biggest difference from, you know, both when I started there and ended up leaving there in 2012. And, you know, I, I got to talk to, you know, some of your former teammates and the guys over on the Into Garage podcast about what's gone on in the years you guys were there and the years since you've left. Like, we – and I, people always say, like, you got to learn how to win. And I feel like that's always too vague. Like, you got to learn the habits it takes to be a functioning football team. Like, mm -hmm. it's about raising the floor, and that's what started to happen as we went along is, you know, when Coach Kelly came in, I always said the best thing, the best attribute that he has is he understands where his feet are, and he understands the resources he has and how to best go about maximizing that. So at Notre Dame, they built a program based off being able to recruit premier offense and defensive line and tight end talent. And as we went along there, we saw defensive backs get better and better. Obviously, you know, we've seen, you know, a bunch of linebackers go to the NFL and stuff too, but they kind of knew what their bedrock was. And so when we got to that 2012 season, it was the third year that coach Kelly had been there. We had kind of started to figure out how things had gone and we had gotten used to what it took there. And now through that volume of reps, we had the confidence, and I'll never forget this. So Rocket Ishmael, obviously Notre Dame, great all-timer, right. came in and talked to our team once when I was there, and he talked about the difference between the best and the worst teams that he was ever on, college or pro. And he said, he goes, the bad teams I was on, we'd get the schedule at the beginning of every year, and we'd look at it and go, well, man, that's going to be a tough game. You know, we're playing USC on the road, or, man, we got Michigan and they got this player. Like, that's going to be a tough game here. He goes, the best teams I was ever on, we looked at that schedule and thought, we'll win every game. Mm -hmm. And it came from a like genuine place of earned confidence. And I remember sitting around before that 2012 season where it is, I'm a fifth year senior. So there's five guys that came in, in my recruiting class that are left. You know, it was me, Braxton cave, uh, John Goodman, Dan McCarthy, Capron, Lewis Moore, Jamora slaughter, who got hurt early in that season. And I'm sitting around with a lot of the older guys, you know, Zach Martin was on that team. A lot of those names that people know, and we're sitting around and it, it was not even just remembering that speech, but we were sitting around looking at our schedule going, well, hell yeah, we can win all these games. Like, there's not a team here that we look at and say is better than us. The number one most insulting question I get was people that look back at that title game and go, well, did you really think you had a chance to win? 
part of my friends, fuck yeah, we thought we had a chance to win. Like, we were the number one team in the country at that point. We had the number one defense in college football for the vast majority of that year. There were like five guys in that front seven that played NFL football coming off that defense. So, yeah, we were confident in what we did. We were wrong. I mean, Alabama ended up being a much better football yes. team than us on that day. And if we play that game ten times, do I think it's as big of a margin each time? No, but we only get to play it once. And so that's how history is going to remember us. That's you know what we earned with that performance. But I think from there – we started to see, all right, everyone learned what it took to get to that point. And then we saw how you know far we were from a team in Alabama who's been the standard for a decade in college football. And so I think what we've seen since then is everyone who comes in now, the leadership in the upper class understands, hey, these are the habits that we need just to have a shot at getting to then the BCS, now the college football playoff. And then you know it's getting even more talent in there at the right spots that'll get Notre Dame over the hump to that next level. But it's that day-to-day -day stuff where guys are actually willing to hold each other accountable because, man, when you lose two games in the month of September, it's real easy to come in and not watch as much tape after, not <laughs> run like you need to after practice. Like you can, you can relax on a lot of that stuff if you're a bad football team because you right. don't have the leadership that's willing to call that out. We had, we had good leaders. We had good individual leaders early on in my time at Notre Dame. You know, Kyle McCarthy's a guy that you'll, uh, I'm sure you yeah. know was mm -hmm. one of my captains there early on, like him, Mo Crum. We had awesome leadership yeah. when I came in, but we didn't have everyone on the same page enough to always take that leadership and know what to do with it. Now everyone understands the standard when they come in here because they've watched the class before them do it, and it's gotten results. Like when you have teams go to the college football playoff, when you have that many guys that are high-level draft picks, you go, all right, it worked for them. So if I come in and I follow the formula and I'm talented enough, it can work for me too. So you kind yeah. of need all of that. Like that's, the, I think, the more intricate answer of learning how to win. Like you've got to go and have a few groups get results maybe before you're ready. And that's the, what I think we were. Like we were not supposed to be that good that year by most people's estimations, but we got results a little bit earlier than expected. And so now every subsequent class can kind of build on that in a way that produces five straight double digit win seasons heading into this year. Yeah. That was the biggest thing for me too, because I was actually committed to Michigan and they, they couldn't get, they couldn't win for anything. So mm -hmm. I was like, I was like, Notre Dame just went to the national championship. I was like, all right, let me, they're, they're on, they're on the up and up. Let me, let me uh, definitely go there. But um, I definitely want to touch on uh, NIL for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and how, and how impactful do you think that'll be? Cause we talk about recruiting and I mean, obviously Notre Dame, I just think the the standard is different at Notre Dame as far as recruiting and things like that. Um but how how big do you do you do you think the NIL um, will be like in terms of recruiting and then like where do you, where do you see it going maybe just maybe not this year because they're still figuring some things out but like where do you think where do you see it going like in the next couple of years? I think it'll get a lot more professional. Like I think people are gonna are still learning, right? Like mm -hmm. most of the NIL collectives that you see pop up right now that are starting to make this look more like pay for play where you're hearing about all these kids offered contracts before they even get on campus and all the stuff that we can't really fully confirm yet, but it's being run by a lot of boosters that aren't affiliated with the school. And so as I think time goes along, what I think we'll start to see is more of a relationship between the school and the people that are running these, because you've had boosters giving to schools to help you bring those nice new football facilities onto campus, to get new practice fields, to get indoor fields built. Like you've always been working with money at schools mm -hmm. to get stuff done. Now it's just to go to the hands of the players. You're just changing where the end goes to the money trail. And so I think we're going to get better through reps at it. What I hope gets better in the immediacy is that guys are getting the education that they need on this because it's not going to be every school offering hundreds of thousands of dollars to everyone it's going to be a part of the recruiting process for everyone, but most guys, especially really good guys, they're going to be able to make money anywhere. It's still going to be about what is going to afford me the best chance to develop as a player? What is going to afford me the best opportunity to play in a college football playoff, to make it to the NFL? All those things are still going to matter. You're not just going to go to a school and ignore the coaching staff and ignore everyone else and think it's going to be okay. Football's too interconnected a game to do that. But I want to make sure that guys now, because it is starting to happen young, are getting education on, all right, hey, when you commit to a school, 
let's make sure that that school's got legal counsel on SCAF who can help guys read these contracts so that they're not getting taken advantage of by people that are coming into this situation and trying to make a buck off the hard work of young athletes who may be seeing more money than they've ever seen in their lives in some cases Mm. early on in their college careers. Let's make sure that there are some, because people want guidelines for all this stuff. I want guys to be able to make as much money as they humanly can. I just don't want the third party people that are always going to pop up in this and already have to go and take advantage of that while everyone's still getting the reps at doing this. Cause you guys know our schedules are already crazy packed. Like that's the biggest difference is right. you've still got to be academically eligible at most of these places. And like, especially <laughs> like talking about Notre Dame and Syracuse, you still have to go to class. Like it's not just like being in the NFL where I get to go to football and then I can go to photo shoots. I got time to go to appearances. I can do all those other things with the rest of my day. Like you still technically have to go to class. And until that's no longer a part of the situation, You've added another potentially very lucrative, but also time consuming thing on the plates of people that already have so much of their time bought up. And so it's just learning again, how, you know, we, we talk about time management all the time. As soon as you get onto these campuses, it's just going to be even more of that right now, but with the stakes a lot higher guys have to grow up a lot quicker than they did when I was getting recruited and coming out of high school. And so I just hope that these schools that claim to still be institutions of higher learning that want to do the best and build leaders and young men and women and all that stuff, live up to it, live up to it in the ways that are important. Make sure that players are getting financial literacy courses, make sure that guys understand how to do the things with their money so that it can help them now. And listen, if guys don't go pro now you walk into the real world, knowing how to do all that stuff. And isn't that what college is supposed to be? Mm -hmm. That's that's an interesting point. I always thought you you, you make some you make some funny it, some good points, but they're also funny. And I was I follow you on Twitter, I follow you on Instagram, and it's like I'm like, oh, is, is he is he trying to be funny here or? Because I I mean I feel like some people just got it on Twitter, and it's like I feel like you've always just been able to just to be to be an open book, to be yourself, and so uh, definitely love following you and your content on Twitter. But um, I. Right. Me, me, uh, me, and Carl recently started to like dive into this, and that's the live golf. And so I'm not, I'm not sure if mm, you, yeah. if you looked at that much, but um, from, from, I guess me and me and Carl, we talked about it, and it's like it's, it's pretty cool. Like I don't, I'm gonna be honest, I don't know, I don't know too much about golf, but like doing the research, and I, I found out like you don't actually get signed for just being like a PGA uh, yeah. or being on the PGA, or you don't get paid for just signing to the PGA. Um, and I didn't, I didn't know that. I thought if you were a PGA like offer, maybe you just signed a contract and it's like, boom, like PGA pays you. But the whole live thing, which is pretty cool. is like, once you sign, it's like, you're paid. And it's like the performance really like, doesn't matter. It's just like guaranteed money. It's uh, so to, so to speak. But, um, what's, what's your take on, on, on that whole situation? And, um, just like, do you, do you, do you, do you mind, I guess, because players are coming out and saying like, yeah, like I would like. I think it was uh, DJ today, or I don't know if it was today, but he came out and said, like, he's like, a lot of players don't like to play as much golf as you think we do. And he's like, he's like being able to get paid this, this money um, allows us to, like, spend more time with our family, do things outside of golf and all that other stuff. So what's, what's, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think it's interesting and complicated because we know where the money's coming from with that, like the Saudi government that backs that league. And we heard it said very publicly, like, the whole reason we talk so much about this league is because Phil Mickelson, one of the most popular golfers in the last decades, my entire you know adult lifetime, got caught as as a book was being written about him, written about him, saying that like yeah, I know what this country has done in murdering journalists, in the way yeah. that they approach gay people, like all of these awful things that they've done. But Phil said, I want to use this basically as a leverage point to try and get the PGA to do better by us. And mm -hmm. as a guy who's always player first, I love avenues where players can kind of upset the apple cart and force whatever that is. You know, the same way we have the transfer portal in college football and NIL, I say, well, all right, now schools have to keep their promises. Now you can't just, you know, tell recruits and sell them the dream, and then they get on campus and now, all right, we'll treat you how we treat you. Like, no. I have some avenues to get out of here if I want to, if you're not going to live up to your end of the bargain. And so I think that as a principle is something I always support. And we know this isn't the only league where the money's, you know, soaked in some things that we're uncomfortable with, but we heard about it. That was the story early on. And that was how we came to know this league. If that doesn't happen, I think we talk about this a lot different right now, but mm. it's whereas the rest of the time, the conversations are a little more hushed about, 
who's funding this, you know, who, you know, a Russian oligarch who buys, you know, I, I support Chelsea in the Premier League in English soccer. A Russian oligarch buys that, and you know, all right, that might, you know, not be the most greatest thing as we're seeing play out right now, but it's not talked about quite as publicly, whereas this was the entire story. And so I, I think they've got a long ways to go if you're a player, and we've seen there are some big names, but for the most part, it's guys that you have not really heard of as much who have the chance to make life-changing sums of money. And there's part of me that says, man, if I'm a no-name golfer who might struggle to make it on the tour and someone's going to offer me 50 to $100 million, would I be able to turn that down? I don't know. I, mm -hmm. I would like to think that I would have the moral high ground to stand on there, but I also know that that's money that, like you said, can buy you a lot of things and a great future for your family. And so I think as a product – they're struggling a little bit right now. It's not as accessible to a lot of people. I don't think it's as top-end quality as something like the PGA. But I think it is a fascinating case study because we don't have other leagues trying to compete with the biggest leagues in North American sports. The XFL and the USFL aren't trying to compete with the NFL. The Overtime League or the G League Ignite aren't trying to compete with the NBA. They're supplemental. This one is a direct competitor. And so we've already seen, you know, uh, 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 Jay Monahan, the commissioner of the PGA Tour, came out and had some comments after their tournament this weekend. It's going to be interesting from a WWE standpoint of watching conflict. I don't know if it's going to necessarily be like good for the game of golf, so to speak. It'll line some people's pockets, but I, I don't know if this helps the sport become more popular in the way that maybe Phil Mickelson or others tried to position this. I think it's a cash grab. Got you. Yeah. Carl, you got anything? <laughs> no, nah, I, I think he really hit that on the head. Cause, <laughs> uh, like, I, I was very, like, like, uh, like you said, read things about it, but didn't know much, you know, too in depth about it. But like you said, we all, everyone has a price tag, so to speak. But in the same token, you will hope that, you know, that even that, even with that high price tag, you will have the moral high ground to, you know, say no to some things. But I'm not in their shoes, so I'm not going to be up here and sit on this moral high ground and, and tell somebody what I couldn't couldn't do because I'm not in that position. I'm, I, I just started playing golf two weeks ago. I'm not in that position. All right, so I, 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 can't, <laughs> I can't really relate to that. No, it's wild, man. Too, I saw the videos. It looks like an EDM concert over there at these golf yeah, tournaments. I, it is I wild. Was, I was I was trying to tell him, I was like, bro, we should go to one. And he's like, oh, I don't want to watch golf and everything. And I was like, and I sent him a video of a concert. I was like, it's not only golf. Like, you can go to the concert, you can meet some people. Like, it's, it's, it's a whole, like, networking event. Yeah, I don't know what it's like watching golf on Molly, but I have a few, a few of those people found out. <laughs> no, that's facts. That's I'm, sure, I'm sure they had an experience for sure. Yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm 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 thankful for you. Uh, definitely hopping on. I know I know you're in the middle of traveling. I mean, you you stopped halfway for us, so uh, pro probably in a hotel room right now. So I mean, I I really I greatly appreciate you. I remember um, at the spring game, I was like, my brother pointed you out, and I was like, oh, I gotta go talk to him. And so um, I know we we kind of probably like our first actual like uh, face to face conversation at the spring game. So. Um, and you were just like more than willing to just even give me some tips there and just like anytime I need anything just to reach out. So um, thankful for that this time came. But I guess just one more thing before we leave, like what are some tips for, I guess, someone like coming up in this space like us um, or just anyone who's who's just, who's just like trying to get their foot in the door um, in this in this industry? Yeah, I, I would say really be a consumer as much as you are a producer. Like, I, I, especially this trip has been awesome for me because I've gotten to go back and not only listen to myself, but listen to other people that I enjoy and figure out kind of like Carl, you were talking about before, we're all trying to figure out parts of other people's game that we like for ourselves. I'm now at a point where I feel comfortable in, all right, I know what I am. And so I can do a better job of kind of adding things or seeing how someone structures an argument or an idea they come up with for a segment and saying, Oh, okay, that makes me kind of think of things in a bit of a different way. So I think listening always helps to yourself and to others because you learn a lot just through sheer reps. It's like what they always told us when you're sitting in the back of a drill, mental reps, that's a real thing in this line of work, getting as many of those as you can. So I would say listen a lot to that. Hunt feedback aggressively. Like if you've got someone that you trust enough, that you will give you their time, say, hey, can you take, and I'm Sean, you DM'd me and said, hey, this is a clip from our latest podcast, can you listen to it and check it out? Like, if you've got people that are willing to do that, 
take them up on it. And, you know, we all have an ego and we all, you know, do that. But uh, being a former athlete, I like to think we all also take criticism pretty well, especially when it's constructive. So be open to that stuff and don't be afraid to try things out, like especially early on. And this is the thing I'm trying to remind myself of right now as I am new in the podcast space is while I know how to, at this point, structure a show, get things to a point where it sounds good, we're going to convey information, we can have some fun. I kind of know formulas for, for how to do that now just through reps and through time, but I also don't know what I can all do in this space. I've seen what others can accomplish. And so you only get to that point by taking chances, by trying things out, you know, interview someone different than you might have a time before, reach out to a person that you may not have considered before, try a, a, a way to present an argument. Maybe you heard someone else do it. Like I always look at, you know, a guy like Colin Cowherd and the way that he sets things up and the detailed analogies that he uses and said, all right, can I find a few of those things that I can work in there? And maybe I'll try it out and it'll suck. And maybe it won't go very well, but I'll get something out of that experience. And so I think we're all, you know, by nature, perfectionists, especially in this job, it's gotta be that willingness, you know, and that was the best thing that happened to me. I did a radio show from four to 6 a.m. Eastern. Nobody was listening to that shit. Like my bosses weren't even up listening to that. And so I just got to try stuff and fail and mess up and do that over and over again. And, and it sounds cliche. Everyone's going to tell you guys to get reps, but it really is the only way to do this. And, and then I would say, you know, in the word vomit that has been all this advice, just try a bunch of different things too. Like you guys are doing podcasting right now and it's great, but Maybe there is another part of this that you like, you know, Carl, you're doing, you know, you're doing stuff in studio right now. Maybe you do like that. Maybe radio is something. If you try it, you'll enjoy. Who knows if you've ever thought about writing, give that a shot. There are plenty of ways, sub stacks, all this different stuff that you can publish that stuff, like find different ways to get your ideas out there and see what you end up liking. If you haven't already, that was another thing. You know, I worked in digital calling games, radio, TV, like got to do all those different things. And I think through all that, you kind of find tools that make you better at every job and find things that you might really enjoy. And I think especially early on, if you've got the opportunity to, those are always good things to take advantage of. No, I really appreciate you stopping by. I know I've seen your work from afar and then hearing your story up close and personal, it all makes sense. Uh, I just want to say I was outnumbered today and I know that Notre Dame, y'all know, y'all got us in the athletic space right now. But just to remind everybody at home and y'all, too, we still got y'all up in the media space right now. I know we, we see y'all coming. All right, but don't get it twisted. We still got y'all in that aspect. And no, I really appreciate you, man. It was, uh, it was cool to hear from you and your story, man. No, definitely. Carl, it was, it was it's certainly nice to meet you on here, man. Looking forward to watching you and all this. Sean, I, I have been a big fan of yours for a while. I, I think I'd... I got a chance to tell you this, but like watching you as a player and seeing what you had to overcome injury wise and the way that you always came back and how hard you fought for that team and for that school. You know, I, I remember talking to, you know, your coaches at that time, other media members about it. Like people noticed that stuff, man. And it was really important to a place that matters a lot to me that I know matters a lot to you. So I, I did just want to, you know, not get out here without saying I admired the way you handled your business with a lot of that stuff. And I, I think so much of that, will definitely be felt in how you approach this job, man. So I know you're going to do great. And, and like I've said and to you and, and for you, Carl, too, if there's anything I can ever do for you guys, give me a shout, man. We're all in this together. It should be fun. It should be something that we can all succeed with together. So uh, thank you guys for having me on, man. Been a ton of fun. Oh, yeah, man. Oh, and appreciate the kind words for sure. I mean, having someone like you say that, especially because it's like when you're going through it, it's just like, you don't think anyone notices just like your, your your tunnel vision. And so you just try to get through it as best as you can. So hearing that from you, I mean, it means a lot. So thank you. Um, again, so we had a, we had another episode of Varsity House podcast. We had uh, we got on uh, Mike Golick Jr. and Carl Jones. Um, another great episode. We learned a lot from one of the best in the business and can't wait to see what he has um, going for him just in the near future and um, just Hopefully just continue. We want to continue Varsity House just to continue to grow and just continue to bring on people who we can learn from, who, who the fans want to who, who the fans want to hear from. So please give us feedback and uh, maybe sh shoot us some comments on who you want to hear next. But uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel at Varsity House Podcast and um, follow us on all our social medias um, at Varsity House Podcast. And again, we thank you and uh, appreciate your, your support and listening.